Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Skyrim's a game where there's a lot going on. A dragon invasion, a civil war, a re-emerging cult of assassins, and so much more. To top it all off, The Elder Scrolls V rests on the shoulders of a 25-year-old franchise, with its own established narratives and lore. With so many complexities to manage, Bethesda's writers were poised to contradict themselves every now and again when crafting this RPG no matter how hard they tried not to. And indeed, Skyrim has a little bit of writing that occasionally conflicts with itself and some narrative inconsistencies that occasionally conflict with the writing itself and lore of the universe we know to be true. When such instances occur, they're referred to as plot holes, and some can be pretty entertaining to learn about. We took a look at some of my favorites a while back, and you guys really seem to enjoy that video. So, here we are for round two. Sit back and relax as we dive right in to five more interesting plot holes you may have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, Brand Shea is a dark elven merchant and shopkeeper who operates a miscellaneous goods stall in the city of Riften. Uniquely, Brand was raised not by fellow Dunmer, but instead a family of Argonians. Hence his lizard-like name. Evidently, as a newborn, he and his original elven parents were sailing from Morwind to Skyrim when their ship was hit by a storm. It quickly wrecked, and everyone aboard the vessel, except the baby Brand, perished in the chaos and confusion. The small child was found by some Argonians, who took them in as one of their own. While very grateful to this adoptive family, the Dunmer has spent much of his life trying to learn more about his biological parents, so he might carry on their memory. He'll ask the player if you wouldn't mind searching the area around where his family's ship crashed so long ago, and bring back any artifacts or mementos you might find. This begins the quest, Distant Memories. When we arrive at the shipwreck, the pride of Telvas, a journal of Bran's original father, someone named Limdren, can be found, and it contains some shocking revelations. According to his dad, Bran Shea didn't just come from any Dunmer family, but the last remnants of the great house Telvanni. Anyone who's played The Elder Scrolls III will recall Telvanni as among the most powerful and richest families in all of Morrowind. The journal notes that the family was fleeing their homeland in response to countless invasions and the eruption of Mount Vardenfell. At the time this diary was written, Morwind had descended into borderline anarchy, and Great House Telvanni had virtually collapsed, with Bran's family being all that was left. Lindran goes on to bluntly state that with everyone else dead, his baby boy is Telvanni's last living heir. So this is some pretty heavy stuff. Branche descends from an incredibly prominent lineage. Anyway, once we deliver him the journal, he'll be stunned, and offer us some coin for all we've done, completing the quest. Alright, so what's the issue here? Well, for better or worse, seemingly none of what that journal says about House Telvanni was true. Like, at all. Despite claiming the house had been pretty much wiped out, in the Dragonborn DLC, one of our greatest allies is Neloth Telvanni, who is not only a Telvanni, as you can kind of tell, and very much not dead. He even tells us that House Telvanni is alive and well back in Morrowind, having never lost its status as a great house, pretty much contradicting everything Limdren said. Everyone has heard of the Master Wizards of Morrowind? We are one of the great houses that rule Morrowind. Equally as damning is that within the College of Winterhold, we can meet a Dark Elf student named Brainella, who claims her family are Telvanni mages. So this whole brand Shea is the secret last living heir of a noble family stuff just doesn't make any sense. It's not true. But it is a good story, I suppose. Next on our list, we have the curious case of when exactly Serana went to sleep. Alright, so we all know her, but some context is necessary. Introduced as the principal companion in the Dawnguard DLC, Serana is the vampiric daughter of Lord Harkin. According to legend, Lord Harkin needs Serana's blood in order to fulfill the Prophecy of the Sun, essentially complete a ritual that is meant to permanently blot out the sky and place all of Tamriel in an eternal night, which has some obvious advantages if you're a vampire. That's why thousands of years ago, 
Though, exactly how long is sort of what this plot hole revolves around. Serana's mother Valerica, in order to keep her safe from Harkin, sealed her daughter away in an ancient Nord tomb, and sent her into what was supposed to be a nearly eternal slumber, where her dad could never find the girl. Early on in Dawnguard's questline, regardless of whether you decide to back the vampires or vampire hunters, the Dragonborn will awake Serana, and she'll become a strong ally. Now, one of the Skyrim questions that has left the community baffled and in disagreement for ages is how long was Serana asleep before we woke her? We know the Volcahar clan of vampires is thousands of years old, but we're less sure of how many thousands. So, there's a nearly infinite number of possibilities. And, unfortunately, due to some conflicting writing, it seems not even Bethesda is 100% sure how old they made this sassy young vampire. In what is your first conversation with Serana, she'll be taken aback to learn that Cyrodiil is currently the seat of an empire. So, she already must be older than the Septim Empire, which began in the late Second Era. When taken to Dwarven Ruins, she'll react with shock that the dwarves themselves aren't present, surprised to learn they've all disappeared. Needless to say, this is quite telling, as the Dwemer vanished during an event known as the Battle of the Red Mountain in the year 700 of the First Era, around 3,000 years ago. So, Serana had to have been sealed prior to then, right? Well, at the same time, despite supposedly going to sleep before 700 of the First Era, she seems completely unfazed by the existence of Dark Elves, a race of elf that literally didn't exist until after the Battle of Red Mountain. So, what's going on here? Well, thankfully, we need not think too hard, because back in 2013, Matt Grandstaff, a Bethesda community manager, addressed some fans asking these very questions over on Twitter. And this was his response. Quote, The intention was that Serana went to sleep in the late Second Era, between the Riemann and Septim Empires. Her initial dialogue is just her surprise that there's an empire in Cyrodiil, as there hadn't been one when she went to sleep. End quote. So, there you go. According to Bethesda's official stance on the matter, Serana went to bed in the Second Era, well after the Battle of the Red Mountain. So, by then, the dwarves should have been long gone, and them still being missing when she woke up shouldn't have come as news to Serana. So, whoever was writing that dialogue where she expresses her astonishment at the Deep Elves' absence just appears to have made a bit of an oopsie. Coming in at number three, speaking of vampires, Zabil Stentor is Solitude's court wizard. But that's perhaps the second most interesting thing about her as she's also a vampire herself. Not only do the game's files reference her as one, but when spoken to, a number of characters throughout the city comment on the woman's suspicious behavior, and she goes so far as to make some allusions to her hidden nature herself. In some dialogue we can have with the woman, Sibyl states that she served the City of Solitude for years, having first been appointed by High King Eastold, the father of Torig, the King Ulfric killed. She comments that she personally had a hand in raising Torig from his birth, and watched him grow up. And that's where things get a bit weird. You see, Torig was around 30 to 40 years old when he was killed. Being generous, let's say Sibyl was 20 when she became the court mage, and Ulfric was born that day. She was probably much older, and Ulfric likely wasn't born, That you, you get the idea. So, being very generous, this would make Sibyl somewhere around 50 to 60 years old, though she's likely a lot closer to 80 or 90. So, the question is, why doesn't she look nearly that age? And how come no one seemed to notice this court wizard that never ages? Sibyl is a master of the arcane arts, so at first it's easy to imagine that perhaps she's employing some sort of illusion magic to ensure that those around her don't catch on to the secret. But even then, she stands front and center when visitors from across Tamriel visit the court, and is likely well known by the entire city and much of Tamriel's nobility. So is she just fooling everyone? Heck, as we mentioned, there are a couple of characters we can speak to that do seem to suspect Sibyl might be a vampire, 
though they're far from sure and seem to have no concerns about her aging. Is anyone not freaked out by the girl who's been doing the same job for seven to nine decades while everyone around her passes away and retires? Honestly, despite it not making for the most coherent of a narrative, I'm not really bothered by this one. I think it's neat Bethesda decided to add some spice in Solitude's Blue Palace. Even if it seems impossible. For fourth spot, this one requires a tad bit of background info. The Eye of Magnus is an ancient, seemingly magical, and likely even divine artifact, central to the College of Winterhold's main quest line. We'll first discover it early in the story arc, as the Dragonborn and a group of classmates descend into the ancient Nord ruin of Sarthal. Before finding the object, we'll briefly be separated from the group, and have a vision of a strange man, claiming to be a member of something called the Sigic Order. He'll warn us that something bad's about to happen, before disappearing. Later on, after discovering the floating orb, the professors will be stunned and take it back to the college for further studying. Then again, those Sigic guys will reappear, warning us of the power the Eye of Magnus possesses, before again disappearing. Skipping over a handful of missions the college sends us on to further the institution's understanding of the Eye, the questline will ultimately climax when Encano, a Thalmor advisor to the college's archmage, attempts to harness the power of the sphere for himself as a part of a strange grand plan that admittedly isn't very well explained. Long story short, he kills a number of students and professors in his scheme, and the story ends with the final showdown between you and the elf. As you can probably guess, the elf loses, and afterwards those Sigic Order guys will reappear once again, to congratulate you on saving the college, before taking the Eye of Magnus for themselves back to their headquarters for safekeeping. And this officially ends the College of Winterhold questline. Okay, so there are the spark notes. So the big question now is, why didn't the Sigic Order just take the Eye of Magnus to begin with? Again, Winterhold's storyline has received a lot of criticism for not being a very well-fleshed-out one, and failing to explain a lot. But this is perhaps the most glaring flaw. The Sigic Order knew of the Eye's power, they knew where it was, they knew it was going to be the catalyst for something horrible, they've evidently always had the ability to move the Eye somewhere safe, Yet they waited until a bunch of innocent people died to have done anything about it. You could argue that maybe they just didn't want to interfere with outside affairs. Sort of like how the dudes who make those Planet Earth documentaries don't like to mess around with the animals they film. But if that was the case, then why did they go out of their way to warn us about the artifacts so much in the first place? And then they still took it anyway. I mean, I guess it could be argued that the Order is merely incompetent, and that would explain away everything, albeit it's not a very satisfying answer. As you can probably tell, I'm very perplexed by this. I don't know. I guess for now I'm just pretending this quest line never happened until further notice. And finally, last on our list, this one's so obvious when you think about it, and not relevant to the game's story, I'm basically cheating. But nonetheless, the Thieves' Guild quest, Dampened Spirits, will see the player hired by Maven Blackbriar, owner and proprietor of the Blackbriar Mead Company. She wants you to put her biggest competitor, a Nord named Sabjorn, who owns the Hunting Brew Meadery in Whiterun, out of business. But she can't let you just murder the guy. Maven has a reputation for being a cutthroat, and if one of her biggest rivals suddenly died or disappeared, people would ask some questions. So instead, she and some associates have developed a cunning plan. Sabjorn is hosting a small mead tasting for some of Whiterun's guards very soon. She wants you to poison that mead in order to get Sabjorn arrested and jailed. Skipping over some small details, after accepting the quest, you'll head over to the Honey Brew Meadery, where Sabjorn is already getting ready for the tasting, sneak into the boiler room, and drop some skeever poison into one of the large tanks. Then head back to the Meadery's bar, where you're just in time to watch the tasting begin, and watch as Sabjorn gets arrested after the guards taste something fishy. And the quest will be completed. Okay, so did you catch it? Did anything not really add up in that whole summary? Let me explain. You poison a large container full of water that's being heated to make mead, 
and then run over to the mead tasting and watch as the guards are poisoned by mead that was already prepared and in a container that you did not poison. The poisoned stuff is still sitting in the boiler room. So what happened here? The game's logic seems to assume by dropping that skeever poison in that container, all of the mead Hunting Brew Meadery has ever produced just magically got poisoned too. Which, of course, can't be the case. It is possible the guards were just faking it, I guess. Also, and really this is kind of fun to consider, maybe Sabjorn did poison his own mead before the tasting anyway. You didn't even need to do anything. He was already planning to hurt the guards himself. Though I doubt that's the case, as fun as it is to assume. This is just one of those things that when I first noticed a few months ago when making a previous video, I instantly knew it didn't make any sense and wrote it down in a notebook, hoping I'd get to use it in a future video. And finally today, that dream has come true. Anyway, with that we are going to wrap up. Five more of my favorite plot holes in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by everybody. Real quick, I do want to mention, these videos aren't meant to be, like, dunking on Bethesda or anything. I understand a lot of these errors in the grand scheme of everything are pretty minor, and the writers do have quite the job cut out for them. Regardless, what things do you imagine might be able to explain away some of what we've covered? And what points in Skyrim's narratives have you noticed where things didn't really add up? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.